guys, it's Will from Tested. It is time for another edition of the Tested Video Mailbag. I've got a bunch of great questions today. Let's get started. This summer, I had a trip to Vegas and stayed at a hotel on the Strip that was charging $15 a day for internet. How are they charging this ridiculous price when many cheaper hotels have free Wi-Fi? This is really the great dichotomy of our time. If I go to a $69 a night Best Western, odds are those guys have free Wi-Fi. If I'm staying at a $500 a night Four Seasons, no Wi-Fi, or they charge $15 or $20 or some ridiculous price for it. The solution, get a phone that has mobile broadband hotspot. Even if you pay $20 a month for the month that you're traveling, you turn it on and off as you need it. Um, it's a great feature. The newer Droid phones from Verizon have it. The Pre Plus has it. I don't think it's on the Captivate. I'm not sure about the T-Mobile phones, but definitely check with your provider and see if they offer a mobile hotspot. I know that the Evo 4G has that as well. So, Matt Jam 3000 asks, the maker bought music that plays as it's in making mode. I want it. I want it bad. How do I get it? Well, the answer is that you need to send a really nice, post a really nice message on the forums at Tested.com, and, uh, well, one of us will tell you where to find the, the, the music. You can download it. I think it's actually royalty-free. We pay for a subscription or something. I don't know what that gives us the right to distribute it. But at the very least, I can direct you to the place where you can then pay to download the music. The next question is cupcakes. Your side of the story, question mark. I like cupcakes. I'm a big fan. I don't get the current cupcake craze that is sweeping the nation. I don't believe in the Sprinkles cupcake. I, I like to get a fantastic cupcake from a local bakery. My favorite, San Francisco Citizen Cake. It's a fantastic, fantastic cupcake makery. Uh, they also bake a whole bunch of other awesome stuff. So uh, that is my feeling on cupcakes. I am strongly pro. Do you believe that the iPhone 4 will be coming to Verizon this January? I saw something about it on your site. I, you know, at this point, we've seen so, so many of the iPhone on T-Mobile, iPhone on Sprint, iPhone on Verizon, iPhone on name your other carrier here. I don't, I'm not, I'm not making any bets at this point. I know that the contract for AT&T is up soon. Uh, I mean, it's possible that the iPhone will come to Verizon. However, Apple hasn't made any CDMA versions of the iPhone to date. So if they do, it would be the first one. I mean, it makes sense for Apple to, to release the iPhone on Verizon, given the success of, of Android in general and the Droid-branded phones on Verizon. So, I mean, we'll see. I'm not holding our breath, though. The next question is about StarCraft II, and an anonymous person wants to know what my favorite StarCraft II race is. I like to play Terran uh, just because everybody else seems to be playing Protoss, uh, and Zerg seem to be pretty uh, underpowered right now. So I'm playing Terran... Uh, I've had a pretty good, I'm about 50-50 right now, but I seem to be getting better, so uh, that's good. And I still have my final placement match to do, which I think I'm probably going to do tonight, if I have a little bit of time. The next question is, thinking about switching to Android, what's the best unlocked Android phone at around the $500 level, and where are they sold? Um, you know, if you're on it, it depends on your provider, right? There's GSM phones, there's CDMA phones... And there's actually a difference between the AT&T and T-Mobile version of the GSM phones. They use a different frequency band. You may not get 3G on an AT&T phone with a T-Mobile phone or vice versa. So you have to be really careful. If you want to pay 25 bucks to sign up to be an Android developer, you can still buy the T-Mobile branded uh, Nexus One, which is, I think, my favorite GSM version of phone. However, if you plug that phone into AT&T, you won't get 3G mobile internet on it. So um, that's kind of a downer. Uh, you know, really, there isn't a good carrier uh, agnostic uh, Android phone available right now. If you're on Verizon, I like the Droid X. I haven't spent a whole lot of time with it, but I think it's what I would buy right now if I were buying a phone. Uh, we have the Droid 2 in-house, but it, it's kind of big and bulky. It has this physical keyboard. I'm not super impressed with it so far. Uh, the Captivate on AT&T has a whole host of problems that I talked about in my review, which you can find on Tested.com. I, I mean, it's it's a little bit of a dark time for Android, despite the fact that we're seeing a lot of great phones. Uh, and then the Evo 4G is, of course, the, the, the phone to have on Sprint, but battery life problems. And uh, actually, I should mention the Droid Incredible on Verizon, which is, I think, their most popular Android phone right now. It's uh, a little bit smaller. It's iPhone size. Had some battery life problems at the beginning, but I think they fixed a lot of those now. So, I mean, there's a lot of good options out there. There aren't a lot of good unlocked options. Your unlocked option is pretty much Nexus One, uh, at least right now. The next question is uh, about OS X. 
What would you suggest to help someone make the switch from Windows to OS X? My grandfather has been hit with a bunch of nasty viruses, and I'm looking into how horrible an idea it is for him to switch. He's far more tech-savvy than the average 88-year-old. You know, I'm, I don't think that it's a good idea to switch an 88-year-old who's relatively proficient at computing from one OS to another. I, I think, I mean, if you have a Mac and you want to sit him down in front of him and see how he does, that's fine, but I think it might actually, I mean, I don't want to sound ageist here, but it, it, it's, I mean, you don't want to pull the computing rug out from under someone that's almost 90 years old, I don't think. Um, what I would say is you're better off hitting him with uh, setting up Windows in a way that's really locked down and super secure. So uh, if he doesn't need to install a bunch of applications all the time, get the computer set up the way he wants, turn his account from an administrator account into a guest account. That will help lock it down on almost every OS, every version of Windows, whether he's running XP, Vista, or Windows 7. If he's running Windows 7, install all the latest updates, turn his firewall on, um, do the UAC stuff. I mean, there's a lot of stuff you can do to make Windows very secure. There's no, and then the other thing to do is to teach him how to be a safer computer, a uh, computer user. So um, teach him about not clicking on, you know, dangerous links, not opening attachments for everyone, all that kind of stuff, and that will go much further, I think, than switching to Mac. I don't think switching somebody who's 90, 88, 90 years old to Mac is a good idea. But it is totally rad that your grandfather is using a computer well enough to get infected with viruses. So, you know, you have that going for you, at least. Um, the next question is about Kung Fu. How can I know, absolutely, if my Kung Fu is better than your Kung Fu? I, I think there's only, we got to settle it in the Matrix is all I know, so. Kind of a short question, I guess. An even shorter answer. I'm going to have a drink of water now. It's delicious water. This is a question I don't know the answer to. I'm going to ask it anyway, see if maybe one of you guys knows. And if you don't, then we'll do some research and figure it out. The question is, does playing audio files of higher bit rates affect battery life in any way? Um, I kind of... I don't know. I know that compressing stuff is going to use more or less power if you compress it with a lower bit rate because there's kind of more math happening. I actually don't know uh, about uh, battery life when you're playing back bit rates. My hunch would be that the hardware decode for MP3 that's built into a lot of players these days is kind of kind of obviate any benefit you'd get from using a higher or lower bit rate. I think it's going to end up pretty even. But but I mean, what do you guys think? Let us know if you've done any testing in the in the comments. And if nobody comes up with an answer, we'll give it a test and answer in a couple of weeks, see if we can figure out a way to test that. What do you use to trim your manly beard, asks an anonymous person from the internet. Um, I actually use a $30 wireless, I think it's a Zoll beard trimmer, wall maybe, W-A-H-L, beard trimmer. It has little plastic guards, I just go down every week or so and... Uh, you know, keep the neck area a little tidier with a normal, you know, shaving razor. If you had to give up one of the following, this is this is a crazy hypothetical question. If you had to give up one of the following, TF2 or coffee, which would it be? I would find out who was making me. Uh, no, that's a cop out. I, I'd give up TF2. I can't. Coffee, coffee is an integral part of my life, and I don't think I could continue working in any kind of functional way without some sort of coffee. Plus, it tastes good. It would be a tough choice, though. The next question is fantastic. It is, given a decent budget, about how often would you recommend building a new gaming PC from scratch? How often are there architecture changes significant enough to build a system around? It seems like motherboards are lasting about two, two and a half, three years now, so uh, four factors. So, you know, socket 1136 is about a year and a half, two years old, so we're, we're getting to the end of that. I mean, I think if you time your purchases and your builds around the launch of a new form factor and you luck out and the form factor lives, um, I mean, I think every two, two and a half years is good. If you do some upgrades along the way, you know, if you like to, if you swap out video cards, maybe even add memory, add a new CPU, um, you can make that last longer. I mean, I, I think the way I build my PCs, there's two basic ways to do it. One is to build a new PC and just replace it every two or three years. The other is to build a new PC and use that as a platform for, for kind of enhancement over a longer period of time, which is what I actually do. So if you look at the, the machine that I started with when I built my for what is now my current PC in the current case, it probably started as a Core i7-920 machine um, with a GeForce 8800 GTX or something like that. And I've upgraded video cards and CPUs 
And then eventually motherboard along the way, so now I have a, a much more powerful computer. I, the upshot though is, I think regardless of how you do it, you probably end up spending about the same amount of money either way. So, I mean, I would look at spending $1,500 every three or four years, um, or you know, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less, depending on how you're doing. But the other thing that's important is if your computer is fine, if you're running games to the resolution you want, if you're able to do the video encoding and, and ripping and all that stuff that you want, no reason to upgrade. I mean, stick with the machine you have and, and you know, save that money for something else. Please, can you do a guide on how to do multiple monitors on Windows 7? I have a video card that has two HDMI ports. I'm guessing it's quite simple, but a quick how-to would be great. The how-to is really, really simple. Step one, plug the monitor in. Step two, go to the display control panel where you change your resolution normally and flip on the second monitor. It usually turns on by itself. If you don't even want to go to the control panel, you can hit Windows key plus P a couple of times and it'll cycle through your available options. It is dead simple to set up a second monitor. The only thing you have to really do is in that display control panel, make sure that the, ed the top and bottom edges of the monitor are lined up more or less with the way they, they actually are in the layout. So when you move a window or an icon or something from screen to screen, it doesn't jump high or low as it makes the transition across screens. The next question is really interesting. Have you ever committed to a technology that didn't become the next big thing? I did that for mini discs and HDDVD. What about you? Um, hmm, let's see, I have a big stack of laser discs at home. Uh, I did pretty good on music for the most part, although I did buy some Super Audio CDs and DVD audio discs. But that was more kind of an experiment to see what the formats benefited. I didn't upgrade anything or go through and redo collections. Um, I, I feel pretty good. I feel pretty good about where I'm at with my adoption. I've, I've been so far pretty accurate and only sussing out the right stuff. And I was a really late adopter to Blu-ray. I didn't buy Blu-ray until uh, buy, buy Blu-rays until I got a PS3. And I think I bought the PS3 when the Metal when Metal Gear Solid 3 came out. So I was very late on the PS3 side of this generation, which saved me a lot of money on Blu-rays early on. I play a lot of video games, mostly shooters and action games with a few role-playing games mixed in there. It's much like me, actually. I play shooters and, you know, played Fallout and Oblivion and all that. But I've never tried real-time strategy. What do you suggest as a first game for a newbie real-time strategy player, preferably with a good single-player campaign? Right now, there's one real-time strategy game to be playing. It's the, all the current hotness. Go out and buy a copy of StarCraft II. They walk you through the basics really well, despite it being a game with a really crazy hardcore community. And their matchmaking process seems to work really well to match you, match you with people who have a kind of a, a skill level that will challenge you, but not frustrate you too bad. Have you ever tried cash and guns in your board game rotation? Uh, if not, I promise you'll love it. I haven't tried it. I've heard a couple of good things about it from a bunch of different people. We'll uh, give it a try next time we have a board game night. I think we're going to try to do it on Wednesday. We may even set up a camera and do kind of a QTJV live stream of it. Don't know. If you guys think that'd be interesting, let me know in the comments and we'll, we'll make it happen. The next question is from Gamer of Freedom, who chose not to be anonymous on Formspring. His question is, when will This Is Only A Test be going live again? Uh, we stopped doing the live show because, uh, well, we didn't have that many people popping in. Uh, we appreciate the hell out of the people who came every week. Uh, but it's also an incredible pain in the ass to get going. It makes something that, uh, you know, a, a five-minute setup or a ten-minute setup into about a half hour of constantly fighting with the live streaming stuff. Uh, now that we've switched over to Justin TV for our live streams, that may change a little bit. Uh, I, I haven't actually tried Justin TV too much. We're going to do our first live stream. Well, you know, it'll already have happened by the time you guys see this, but later today... So if you uh, would like to see that, let us know. We'll maybe give it a try again in a couple of weeks. Uh, right now, I'm, like, I'm enjoying focusing on making sure that the, the recorded show is awesome every week uh, rather than having to fight with the live streaming all the time. So it may not be the answer you're looking for, unfortunately, but that's where we're at now. The next question is, will you be testing the Cyborg Rat.7 gaming mouse for the PC? I've been reading a lot of mixed reviews, and I do not want to make the purchase until I know it's a good mouse. I ordered one. I've called those guys. They don't have any more review units. Uh, but as soon as we get a mouse, we'll definitely do the test. I've seen really good reviews. Uh, my, my boys at Maximum PC gave it a really good score. I'm always a little skeptical of first-gen gaming mice just because I, I, nobody's ever come out with one on the first pass that was any good in my experience. Uh, but we'll see. I mean, I, I'm optimistic. And those guys do have a pretty good history of making gaming peripherals, so we'll, we'll see how it goes. This is a very interesting question. 
does the prospect of this Sony Ericsson PSP phone interest me? I guess you, I, I say me, but I meant you is what was written. This is confusing, I'm just going to go on. If made a reality, could you see yourself replacing your existing phone with one? Um, maybe. I mean, it depends on the phone, right? I'm, I'm, always, I'm always open to change. I ditched the iPhone. I'm on Android now, so you know, we'll, we'll see. Uh, if it's good, right now it's kind of a mythical product, though, so uh, you know, when, we, when we know more, I can answer that question better. With the new Kindle hardware and price, I'm really leaning towards finally getting one. However, I don't like the policy of having to choose between a physical copy or a hard copy, or an ebook copy, rather. Do you know if they will ever change this policy? Thanks. Um, I, I would like very much for them to change the policy. I think that given the current climate with ebooks and, and pub book publishers, it's unlikely to happen in the not too distant future. Uh, I mean, I think what will happen is one store will, will negotiate that and then everybody else will quickly follow. I, I don't, um, I, I would like that very much too, although I am completely out of bookshelf space in my house right now. So, The next question is about Minecraft. How do you feel about Minecraft and all of the updates slash praise it's received, even from major game developers such as Valve and Bethesda? Dude, I think Minecraft is really awesome. I played it way back in the alpha before there was really a game there, when the game was just like digging around through this maze and, and you know, finding stuff that you could never do anything with. Uh, now that there's an actual kind of game attached, it's even more interesting. I think it's a really interesting indie game uh, for people everywhere. I, I, I like it a lot. So that wraps it up for this week's edition of the Tested Mailbag. Uh, if you have questions, go to formspring.me slash tested and answer the, ask them over there. We'll answer them every week or so. And, uh, you know, you can be anonymous, ask whatever you want, whether it's about phones, PCs, cooking, coffee. I don't know anything about bicycles. You can ask. I'm going to tell you I don't know anything. Uh, but, yeah, ask your questions. We'll answer them. Thanks for watching, and we will see you guys next week. I do not use any Old Spice or Old Spice products.